Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the Tubless Creek Instagram live broadcast. I'm Jason Haas, as always. Um, so my guest this week is Jess Lander, um, wine columnist for the San Francisco Chronicle and makes up a part of what's a really incredible team of, uh, of wine journalists uh, at the Chronicle. It's, it's just amazing what they're doing. So um, I can't wait for you all to get to meet Jess, but um, while we are waiting for people to join, as I always do, I'd like to give you a little update on what's going on at the winery. This is the time of year when a lot of things are happening fast. So big news for us is that we have seen bud break. So I have some pictures of kind of grape by grape how things look right now. So I'm going to start with of the least far out grape, which is Morvedra. So I'm going to go through the major reds that we have. So Morvedra really just sprouted in the last couple of days. Um, this is one of the more advanced buds. There's other buds that look like uh, it's still January, but then we're starting to see some leaves even in these late ripening grapes. And as we move forwards with other stuff, you'll see how, how they are further advanced. So next, Kunwaz. Um, Kunwaz is also late, um, but not quite as late as Morvedra. Next, Senso. Um, we have a. Where's the Senso? Right here. Okay. So, Senso, this is in a, in a really chilly spot. Senso would probably be more advanced than this if it were not at the bottom of our coldest section of the vineyard, but it is. Um, next is Syrah. Um, where you can see we have this cane prune, so it looks a little different, but Syrah is out even a little further than Senso. And then, of course, the the precocious kid who always wants to be the one to raise their hand in class, um, Grenache. Um, Grenache looks way more advanced than everything else because it is. You can even see the beginnings of little flower clusters. So um, bud, break is, bud break is exciting. Um, we are a few weeks late compared to normal, which is... Um, Whatever it's a, it's a function of how wet and chilly our winter was, uh, but it does mean that we are now starting to worry about things like frost. So I have a couple pictures from uh, my home vineyard this morning. And you can see frost on the ground. We had our sprinklers going, um, which um, I don't know how well you can see. I guess you can see some of the the water spraying the micro sprinklers there. Um, it, it didn't get cold enough to do any damage last night, and last night looks like that's the coldest, um, the coldest night of this week. So, um, but we're ready. Um, we're protecting stuff if it needs to be protected, and and have fingers crossed that hopefully, um, hopefully it won't be too bad this year. Um, we are trying to get the sheep through kind of one last rotation through the blocks where we haven't seen bud break yet. We're probably on maybe the last week of being able to do this. They're right outside of the winery today, which is really fun. Um, so anybody who's coming out today or tomorrow, like you'll get to see them hanging out right here. Um, and then uh, beyond that, we're trying to get the, the cover crop under control. Um, it, is, it is pretty wild out there because of all that rain and all the late rain. Um, so we've got, uh, we're, we're mowing every other row to let the cold air drain. We are starting to till in amongst the vines just to, to keep the weeds from growing up and being uh, getting tangled in the new growth. Um, and uh, enjoying this kind of beautiful, lush, waist-high cover crop while it's still there because we're going to have to bring it under control shortly. Okay, um, that, is, that is it. Uh, that's the... That's the the pictures of what's going on in the vineyard. Um, it looks great. We're ecstatic about where we are at this point. Um, and, and so far, so good. Okay. I'm going to invite a request to be a part, so I will say yes to that. And we will hopefully see her momentarily. Uh, okay, let me try doing this a different way. Uh, I will invite her from my end. Hey, how are you, Jess? Hey, how are you? I'm doing great. <laughs> I'm doing great. How are things up north? Uh, warming up, thankfully. <laughs> Just like you guys, I think. I, I remember my mom, maybe three weeks ago now, uh, sent me a text and said, is it ever going to get warm? <laughs> um, it really has felt like a year that, that has been taking its own sweet time to feel like California. Yeah, I think... Uh... 
uh, in my 12 years here, this is probably the latest it's gotten spring-like here. <laughs> <laughs> it does. It is very much, I think, a throwback. If we look at our own weather data, um, it's a throwback to the 2000s. It's, this is what we would have seen a dozen or more years ago uh, yeah. as kind of a normal start to spring. But now it feels really late with, with how much warmer things have gotten. Definitely, I agree. <laughs> okay, awesome. Awesome. So um, I gave everybody a quick teaser for you um, when I first started that uh, that you are a part of what I think is just an astonishing team at um, the Chronicle in terms of the work you do in, in food and wine. I think the the level of coverage that you are able to give to to, to the world of wine through a daily newspaper is 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 it, it's amazing, um, and it's just about unique. It is, in fact, unique in, in America at this point. I mean, there, there's really only one other newspaper that has a full-time wine columnist. Um, mm -hmm. There's just one of him. Um, and I, I want to dive into all of that. But I'd love, I'd love to talk a little bit about sort of your path into doing what you're doing. I, I, so as a writer, which came first, the writing or the wine? Uh, definitely the writing, which is a little, I find, rare in the wine writing world. A lot of people will get into wine and then get into wine writing, but um, definitely the writing for me. <laughs> so how did that how did that start? What was your what was your path? Um, you know, I always I, from a very young age, I just like identified that I enjoyed writing and that it was something I was, you know, had seemed to have a talent for based on feedback from teachers and stuff. And so I pretty much decided I would be a writer at like nine, I think. Um, and it, slowly journalism became more of the the path I would go down I just um, didn't seem to have like as much of a knack for fiction writing and liked telling stories and talking to people and that kind of thing um, and really I was pursuing sports writing originally um, I was in Boston big sports town great place to do that and uh, was on that path and um, ended up getting a job of the Napa Valley Register as a sports writer for their uh, St. Alita and Calistoga high schools, basically. <laughs> I know Vince is on here. Hi, Vince, my old uh, writer <laughs> buddy for uh, Valley Sports. Um, so yeah, very random, moved out to Napa where I knew nothing about wine. And all I really knew was it was like close to San Francisco where I had kind of wanted to maybe live sometime. <laughs> so, so when you were growing up, did like, was wine on your family table? Not really. Um, my mom drank uh, Behringer White's in pretty religiously. And we were but definitely more like a beer family uh, than anything. I think that's more like the Bostonian in us. <laughs> <laughs> um, so was there, was there a wine that for you sort of turned you on to what the possibilities were with it as a sort of as, a, as an entity? You know, I don't really have one of those stories like a lot of people do. Um, I just moved here and you just can't help but getting sucked in uh, by the industry. And, you know, I was really young and pretty poor, but we would try to go to all the free tastings we could, like through Napa Neighbors programs. And, you know, anytime someone was doing an industry event, see if we could like sneak in with someone. And I just slowly became, you know, more and more into it and like enjoyed seeing my palate evolve from what I was drinking, you know, those first couple of years to you know, getting more access and, you know, really taking that further. Um, and then meeting my now husband, who's a winemaker, definitely helped. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's an automatic uh, portal directly into the center of the wine world. <laughs> um, so how did, how did you move from writing about sports to writing about wine? I mean, I understand how you got out here and how you got interested in wine, but how did you make that leap? Yeah, I um, had kind of, I did sports related stuff for a while and then um, ended up because of my husband moving. I did do like two years in the city, which was kind of what I came out there to do and experience that. And then um, because he's a winemaker, decided to move back to Napa um, since he wasn't going to be relocating to San Francisco. So I started my kind of business then doing like writing, content marketing and stuff and just decided one day to send a pitch to a magazine on a wine travel Napa kind of article and they accepted it and I just kind of took off like and it was like wow this is really fun um instead of spending my Friday nights on the sidelines you know, covering football um I'm you know getting invited to wineries and tastings and dinners and parties and just you know it was a lot more fun <laughs> that's pretty good um, and how about how about your move to the Chronicle? How did that come about? Yeah, 
Um, you know, I've been, I freelanced about um, wine, food, travel uh, topics for like eight years, um, pretty much wrote for about every, almost every wine publication out there, you know, decanter, vine pair, wine enthusiast, and was really enjoying that and the freedom and you know being my own boss um, but when the chronicle job came up I really just couldn't like help myself but apply uh, I think before wine and before even sports I always wanted to work for a major uh, newspaper you know beyond the staff that was something that was always a dream and I'd sort of let that dream go a bit um, just because life takes you different directions and here was this opportunity to do that and do it in wine and work with Esther who's an incredible a wine reporter and be like the top dogs, you know, in wine for the newspaper industry by having two full time writers, you know. So, yeah. And, and yeah. You have two, you have two full time writers in the heart of wine country, mm -hmm. and both of you are from the Northeast. <laughs> yeah. like, yep. do you, I mean, is that just a coincidence or do you feel like having a little bit of an outside perspective helps you? sort of put what you're seeing into context for, for readers who might not be insiders and have grown up with it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's definitely a coincidence that we both landed at the Chronicle and we have like these Boston roots and a lot of similarities. You know, the more we talk, the more we realize we have a lot of connections. Um, but that's a really good point you bring up because I think Esther and I have both, both approached wine um, for regular everyday consumers and insiders and industry and i think our ability to do that might come from the fact that we were not raised in this bubble of wine and it, we didn't live and breathe it until later in life and i at least for me i always think about my readers and think about where i was 12 years ago when i knew nothing and had a lot of questions and was very intimidated by asking those questions and like how can i serve them and help them go on that journey in a like non pretentious approachable way. Does that also does it also make it easier? I mean, you're pretty you're pretty tied in now to the industry, but you also have to have a certain amount of willingness to tell the truth about what you're seeing. I mean, mm -hmm. there, there have to be times where, where it's hard given like, who you're surrounded by a lot of the time to, to still feel like, yeah, this is what I got to do. It, yeah, like, is that I don't feel like I asked that question very clearly, but no, I'm exactly what you're saying. It's probably been the biggest challenge of taking this job at the Chronicle because when I was a freelancer, you know, I was pitching stories. I wasn't doing as much hard news reporting as I am now. And it was a lot of, you know, wine country is great. Everything's great. These wines and the tastings and everything is beautiful. And um, part of my job is to report news and talk about the challenges the industry faces and maybe have to write about some bad, bad eggs every once in a while and controversy. <laughs> And because I live in Napa Valley and I am, my husband's in the industry, my friends, a lot of them are in the industry. Uh, there's going to be times where it's like, oh man, I wish I didn't have to write this story, but here we are. And uh, those discussions were had in my interview process about how I would handle that and knowing it was going to be something that we'd face. And it's definitely been the truth. Uh, but I really think that, you know, we need to hold the mirror up when necessary and um not everyone's going to agree with that but i think a lot of wine media and journalism is scores and travel and you know fun features on the people that are working in it and there's not as much of that like hard-hitting kind of stuff so trying to fill that void yeah, yeah. I, and i think that's one of the things that that i've always admired about the chronicles coverage is that Yes, there are parts of it which are kind of helping somebody who wants to explore wine country, explore wine country. But I mean, wine is a big piece of the region's economy. Um, it's a big piece of the tourism. It's a big piece of, I mean, it's a big piece of, some, of what some of the problems are also with the, the part of the world that we, that we both live in, even though I'm in a different part of wine country, but you see the same things. Yes. Um, so that's one of the things that, that Esther has done well since the beginning is, is like dive into the complexities of what I think is sometimes held up as just this kind of pretty, shiny, beautiful, uh, like ideal of a lifestyle. 
Um, and there's much more to it than that. There's, there's, there are labor questions, there are tourism questions, there are economy questions, there's inequality questions. There's all sorts of things that, um, that without considering the coverage of wine's impact on a region is, is, is incomplete. Yeah, and I think, you know, the journalism we're doing can help push wineries and owners and regions to be better and, you know, be sustainable, not just from a, you know, a vineyard standpoint, but their companies and the people they work with and, you know, really just help create change as much as we are this like fun, luxury industry. Um, there is a lot of layers to it and a lot of people within it that it impacts, you know, daily. So. Sure. Um, so like, can you share a little bit about how you come up with ideas for what to write about because it's got to be daunting like being a part of a daily paper it's not like you um, actually have to write something every day but you have to write it's not it, like you're coming out with one article a month i mean you have to you have to have a lot of content yeah it's pro probably like i probably average i'd say like 10 articles a month and you know sometimes that's more or less slightly but yeah it's you're constantly there's no just like okay i'm working on this one story this week i'm always juggling you know probably three or four at a time and part of that job is like constantly being on top of things and spending time finding stories. So um, I know we use a lot of different, I mean, I, you know, follow, I look up news and follow all the other outlets to see what's happening. I am on social media seeing what like winemakers are posting or other people are posting about. Um, but like a lot, my favorite way to get stories and a lot of it is just coming from being out there and talking to people and meeting with winemakers and visiting regions and just like listening to what they're doing and uh, you know, are they doing something different in their farming or their winemaking style that I haven't come across before? Are they working with different grape varieties like you guys that, you know, not others are working with and you know what that could mean. And I really just walk away from those visits and conversations with story ideas all the time. And that's the stuff that gets me excited more than, you know, just the day to day of, Oh, um, you know, so-and-so has acquired this winery. We're going to, we have to cover it, but that's not as, you know, fun for us, I would say. I remember talking to Esther when she when she joined me for one of these conversations last year about her experience getting pulled into essentially writing about fires for for a long stretch. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that's that is both hard news and wine connected because it was really it was so directly impacted impacted the wine community. Have you had a have you had a similar experience where you have sort of been been pulled into these areas that are like maybe wine adjacent but yeah. and especially areas that before I got pulled into them really knew very little about and was like a very steep and quick learning curve one big example is the Silicon Valley Bank story yeah. last month I don't remember when it was but um we very quickly on like a Monday morning had to write this huge story with huge implications for the industry and I don't know a lot about loans and how they're structured and how what happens when a bank you know when this happens, you know, and I don't think a lot of people do because these crashes aren't something that happened for our day. And um, so that's one. And another one that I've really been pulled in with the Chronicle the last year is these development controversies, um, especially in Napa Valley, but, you know, land use and people wanting to develop vineyards in you know, certain areas, especially the hills of Napa County. And there's a lot of um, opposition about it from an environmental perspective and other reasonings and they're very complex topics with a lot of passion behind them and yeah just like interesting how much i've learned and it's a good challenge i really enjoy it but there's times when you're writing those articles and you're like man this is so much work and i don't feel necessarily qualified as like an expert on this so you call the experts and get their opinions <laughs> oh i i can only i can only imagine i see a little slice of that in the things sometimes when i get into a highly technical thing that i'll write about for our blog yeah and just be like oh boy like i was not this is not me talking about what's going on in the vintage this is not me talking about what we're doing in blending this mm -hmm. is not something that i can just throw out in an hour or two like this is something that's requiring actual research into things that i don't know that i might get wrong like well, it's... if we get it wrong like people will email us and tell us so <laughs> careful like our readers really like keep on us and of course we make mistakes sometimes but you don't want to put yourself in that position at all and so you're really and our editors don't have the wine background that Esther and I have so they're less likely to catch those types of things of like actually I don't think this is 
like what that means or how this works, you know? And so it's really up to us to get that correct. And I'll admit, I've called my husband a few times to like, hey, I'm writing about this like wine process or technique and I just want to make sure that like this is what it, I think it is, just to make sure. Because I'm as much as I understand the process of winemaking, I've never made wine. I'm not there doing it, so. <laughs> yeah. Are, are you tempted? It seems like a lot of people who who at various points are either like writing about other people making wine or selling other people's wine end up deciding, hmm, that seems appealing. I, I mean, I get the appeal. I have a lot of friends who have their own labels. And to be honest, I've seen them struggle a bit with like the time and having to get out there and sell it. And, you know, it's, 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 I think it's really fun, but you got to be in it for the right reasons and not to make money, obviously. Um, my husband and I did make one vintage of um, Zinfandel in 2020, but unfortunately we picked it the day before the fires and it just didn't really work out for us. We oh, just man. didn't have the ability to uh, really make sure it went through its fermentation properly and everything. So uh, maybe we have the equipment in the garage. So um, my father-in-law uses it to make Sauvignon Blanc and maybe one day we'll do it again. <laughs> that sounds like you're set up yeah. at this point. Exactly. <laughs> um, um, so are there, like, as, as you've sort of explored wines and wine regions in and around the Bay Area, have there been big surprises for you? I mean, yeah, I love, I really, I'm so intimately, like, connected with Napa and Sonoma, having lived here for so long, and I spend a lot of time there, and it is what the basis of our coverage is in terms of our readership, but I just, I love personally getting out and exploring other regions when I can. So, you know, we had a big package on Anderson Valley drop this week, and that's a place that I have visited many times on my own. Just my husband, and I love going up there, and I've, like, really gotten to know the people up there and what they're all about. And, um, you know, I just love exposing that, exposing our readers to, like, these other places. Um, Paso is another one. I know I spent some time there recently and definitely have some story ideas in mind, and you know, really love, was like really struck by the experimentation going on down there and how open-minded people were um, to just try new things and do things differently and, you know, not be so bound to tradition the way, you know, a more longer standing and has like historic regions like Napa, you know, are. Yeah, I mean, it's both the advantage and the disadvantage of Paso is that, like, we are not associated with a particular grape variety or a particular single tradition. I mean, there's there are kind of overlapping and longstanding kind of cohorts doing everything from Cab and Bordeaux varieties to Rhone varieties like us to Zinfandel to people who are blending those three across lines that you wouldn't normally see crossed in other places to people who are working with lesser known Spanish and Italian varieties. It's, it is a very dynamic place down here. And I can, I can report from on the ground that people were super excited to, to, to see your article about Paso. Uh, Cause it, it's, uh, I mean, the Chronicle is a big deal and, and having, having you guys write about what's going on down here is like, it, it's meaningful. Yeah. Well, I think I, I tell us all the time, like, I wish we could be just like the real authority on all, everything California wine. Um, you know, like there's just, this is the place for North America, I think. Uh, and even maybe like Oregon, Washington, like all of that interests me. Unfortunately, we're still only two people <laughs> and there's so much going on just where we are. So, um, you know, I'm definitely seeking opportunities to like get out a little bit here or there because I think um, there is so much for our readers to explore in a place like Paso as much as not having this like set identity could be difficult and challenging for the vintners there for consumers to visit you know it's like you'll find something you like everyone there's something for everyone but also you might stumble upon something that you thought you didn't like or you have some stigma against um, or you've just never heard of and be like oh maybe I like that now and it's really a awesome place to explore and discover, um, which is, you know, maybe not so much the case in more like monoculture wine regions that we have. Yeah. yeah. I mean, again, that is the, that is the, the strength and the challenge yes. for a region like us. Mm -hmm. uh, like if you, if you say Russian river, people know what grape you're, you're probably going to say next. If you say Napa, people probably know what grape you're going to say next. If you say Santa Rita Hills, people probably know what grape you're going to say next, but with Paso, it's, it, it's not the case. So we all get to forge our own paths. Definitely. <laughs>
Um, so are there kind of wines or styles that you feel like are like maybe being overlooked in California now that people, people should pay more attention to? I mean, I think there, we're definitely seeing this like shift back from the like 1990s, 2000s, like big overripe kind of wines of like, you know, the Robert Parker era and really the shift back to like freshness and acidity and lighter styles. Um, and I think people are taking notice of that, but I just want to see that continue because there's just some amazing, like elegant, balanced wines coming out. And what I find interesting is in the last few years, I've had the privilege of tasting some wines from like Napa in the seventies and like even eighties and they're tasting the way they taste now is just incredible. Like they're holding up so well. And we have this idea that power and concentration and structure is what makes wines last, but you know, maybe that's not always the case. And um, I think that the wines that are, we're starting to switch back and produce now will really have that longevity and like stand the test of time. So, um, but you know, I'm, loving getting more into like Grenache and uh, Gamay and like just these, you know, really fun, fruity, fruit forward breads um, that you can even have a little chilled and that kind of stuff. Just stuff you can drink every day. That's what I drink at home. So <laughs> yeah, it must feel like there must be a certain appeal in championing the those sort of underdogs. So, like it's hard to imagine that like, uh, whatever the multi hundred dollar bottles of Napa Cabernet really need your help to to uh to make it onto the radar yeah, yeah. it's funny I did an article on Cab Franc recently yeah. there seems great Renaissance happening and I've been tasting some amazing Cab Francs uh, the last few years and you talk to the winemakers and you know I think there's this like hesitance of like but we don't want the secret to get out because then everyone's gonna buy our fruit and there's not enough of it planted and um, you kind of walk that line as a journalist of like you want to help your readers discover these really cool things that you're discovering as an insider. And, um, but then you might be spoiling it and it's going to be the next, you know, they, I, one of the winemakers joke that it's like, they hope it's not the next Pinot where it just exploded. And then you have a lot of Pinot Noir that's maybe not so great because it's just, you know, there's so much excess of it. Um, so, but I don't think that's going to happen with Cab Franc. So. No, I don't <laughs> think you have the same, I don't think you have the same risks there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So what, like, what, what comes next for you? What are your, what's the, what are there things that you have that you're like, okay, this is something I really want to explore more in my writing, or this is like, I'd love to write a book or like, are there, are there things that you have in your head that you can share? Maybe there are things you can't share also, but are there things that you can share that you are uh, thinking about? Yeah, you know, it's funny, like, as soon as I took this job, everyone's like, okay, so this is a stepping stone to what? Like, what do you, what, what does this lead to? And, you know, I'm just really enjoying, I think, being in the moment with this job. I'm just over a year in and really liking it. And I don't see a lot of, like, what's next. In terms, when I look at the wine media landscape, I think I have one of the best jobs, one of the best picks there is, especially if I want to live in California. So, um, you know, I'm not, I'm really just like seeing how we can expand our coverage. And like I said, you know, exploring other regions is like a big passion for me that I want to try to pursue more um, with the Chronicle and also just dig more into like these big issues we talked about earlier that are important and aren't maybe being addressed enough um, and people should know about. So as far as a book, I think every writer wants to write a book someday, um, but you know, I know I've published a cookbook two years ago and I, it was quite a daunting, exhaustive process and I know other friends who've done it and, you know, whether there's good money in it. And so we'll see, but um, not, not anything soon unless some publisher calls me with an idea and wants to <laughs> give me a check. <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you feel like, I, this is sort of more connected to maybe the last question I asked you than it is to the most recent one, but like, do you feel like, there's a real opportunity in sort of making inroads into the central coast because the LA times has like to such a great degree, just sort of walked away from wine entirely. Yeah. It um, baffles me that they don't have a full-time like wine critic or columnist or someone there because the central coast is one of my, I think it's like a really emerging part of California wine. And 
I've spent a ton of time down Paso, Santa Barbara, San Luis Obispo. I love the wines coming out from there. Um, there's a lot of experimenting, like I said, going on. And I just, like, I, I feel for the Central Coast and that they're not getting the coverage that I think they deserve. And there's only so much we can do, like I said, with two people and our audience really being Bay Area. So, you know, I think the LA Times needs to get on it. Um, I think they could... They could do as much coverage that Esther and I do on like Napa Sonoma on the Central Coast. You know, there, there's enough stories to tell. It's a it's a huge region and like area. So, and, I mean, and they had a wine columnist for 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 a long time, but they have not for more than yeah, a decade now. I don't know, and I I've heard things like maybe LA consumers are, are or want to get as geeky as North Bay. But I don't know if there's any truth to that. And obviously, you guys get a lot of visitors from LA. So it seems like it's a missed opportunity. <laughs> it was like, seems like an opportunity for you to, uh, to kind of put your stamp on like the Central Coast as a, as, as a region that should be looking to the Chronicle for its news rather than looking, looking south to LA. Mm -hmm. I know, I mean, like, for example, I subscribe to the Chronicle and not the LA Times, um, in large part because of the coverage in in the wine and food section yeah <laughs> awesome um well it has been a huge pleasure i really could hang out with you all afternoon but it's been half an hour um yeah. and i do try to keep these to half an hour so i would love you to share how people who want to follow your work um should best do that i mean obviously you have your you have your instagram handle here but how else people should do it and also um have you talk a little bit about the like if people want to look at the cookbook that you wrote um how they do that yeah um so um you can find my work at sfchronicle.com we are <laughs> that's something um you know gotta pay for quality journalism these yeah. days but, um you know we do if you're interested in food and wine, we pump out a lot of contact content between our team. Um, if you want just like an entryway into it, uh, Esther has a weekly newsletter that you can sign up for that you should be able to find pretty, I don't know the URL off the top of my head, but um, pretty easily on the Chronicle food and wine page. And she'll basically send you a free article each week. And then there's links to other stuff we're working on in those. So that's like a good entry point. Um, obviously on Instagram and cookbook, unfortunately we're sold out. So I did a, um, the central Napa Valley cookbook. It's a cookbook of 33, um, recipes from Napa's top restaurants. And we, uh, donated the proceeds to restaurant workers during the pandemic. Um, really fun project, but we had 5,000 copies and we are sold out. So if you're in Napa, there might be a few stores, uh, downtown that you can find them. You can reach out to me if you are, and I can try to point you in the right direction, but unfortunately that's it well, congratulations that's uh, uh that's great thank you <laughs> cool okay well thank you jess lander thank you for joining me um thank you everybody of the of thomas creek audience and jess's audience um who who tuned in to watch um it's been a pleasure um i'll, I'll be back in two weeks my guest in two weeks will be randall graham which should be really fun um kind of the the the, the founder of our roan rangers movement so thank you again jess thanks jason um, Enjoy the spring weather and everybody else, I'll see you in a couple weeks. Right. <laughs>